I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. Luke 5 is our text, and you'll be able to follow along. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. If you're in the room, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1023. You'll be able to follow along with us in Luke chapter 5. And, uh, and as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Now, if you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, please let us know. Message the service host, email the office. Uh, we will get you a Bible, whether we need to mail that to you or deliver that to you, because again, we want you reading God's Word, because we know if you read and apply it, God will change your life. Hey, uh, I just gotta say that it is good to be with you tonight, uh, today, to this, uh, this, this weekend. It is great to be here because uh, I got to experience COVID 2.0 and uh, survived, that came through, but I'm annoyed because now I've got that post-COVID dry, unproductive cough. Anyone with me on that? You just kinda, you know, it's frustrating, so I wasn't hanging out, I wasn't spending time with people, and I miss people. I, I love hanging out with you guys, and uh, so I uh, wasn't doing that pre-service. I'll be available for a little bit after the service if we need to talk, but uh, trying to protect my voice this weekend and uh, not freak people out, because in this day and age, if you cough around people, uh, you know, it's like people are running for the hills. But see, I like hanging out with people, so uh, can I just encourage you, uh, next, next weekend we're doing our... Fr- you know, next steps classes. Uh, and if you haven't taken any of them, would you sign up and take intro? And, and if you've taken intro, would you take grow? And if you've taken grow, would you take serve? And if you've taken all the others, would you take lead? I'm teaching lead next weekend, three o'clock Sunday afternoon. Love to have you come and do the deep dive with us about why Calvary does what we do. Cause uh, I miss you and I miss uh, hanging out with people. So that's next weekend and, and uh, we can hang out and uh, if you really want to hang out with me a whole bunch, uh, and, and I'm always recruiting. So uh, in October of this year, God willing, we're going to go to the Holy Land, and we're going to go visit uh, the places where Jesus walked. And we've got about 30 people still signed up from the last couple of times it's been COVIDized. And, and so if you want to join in with us, uh, there's some brochures out in the foyer. Uh, again, email us. We'll email you a brochure if you're joining us online. And we would love to take you and experience the trip of a lifetime. It is a discipleship trip. But uh, again, short timers, because we're only nine months out from that. We'd love for you to go along. So check it out if you are interested. So what is the most disgusting thing that you have done? What's the grossest experience you have had? Now, don't tell me, tell your neighbor. You've got about 15 seconds to go ahead and gross each other out. Ready, set, go. What's gross? Online, if you're sitting there watching this with somebody, you need to be telling them about the, the same thing. See, you guys, some of you are telling stories. Some of you are like, I don't, I don't know. I have to think about that. That's okay. When you guys are sharing a meal later on, then just <laughs> go ahead and gross each other out with the stories. See, and I threw that down realizing that uh, first responders and nurses and doctors, morticians, caregivers, and plumbers have a decided advantage (laughs) on the stories. See, for me, I've cleaned public restrooms. It's pretty gross. I drove a, a school bus when I was in seminary and had kindergarten through eighth graders on there. And I cannot count the number of times that little kids would come up and say, Mr. Bus Driver, I don't feel so. Blah. <laughs> so I've gotten to drive with, you know, my clothes covered in vomit and, uh, and I couldn't get away from it. And all the other kids went to the back of the bus and hung their heads out the windows. Uh, so it was pretty gross. Uh, so life can be disgusting. I mean, if you're a parent, you know that, right? Yeah, hopefully the, the fact that it's your DNA in that is not quite as disgusting. But here's the thing. Most of us try to avoid disgusting things, unless, of course, it's your job, and we've already mentioned those. But Jesus did not. Jesus did not. He purposefully, willingly touched one of the most disgusting things in the first century. Luke chapter five, beginning at verse 12, as we continue our series called The Son of God, walking through the book of Luke. 
It says, while Jesus was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged the man to tell no one but to go and show himself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for a proof to them. But now even more that the report about Jesus went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities, but he, with, would, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Uh, now, we read that passage and it's not gross or disgusting to us to read it. In fact, it's a rather sterile account. You know, a man full of leprosy came and fell down at Jesus' feet and asked to be healed, and Jesus healed him. And we read that, and we go, oh, that's nice. But in the first century, a leper, a leper is a person who has a skin disease that rotted the flesh, beginning with the extremities, uh, and, and this man was full of leprosy. So he might have looked hideous. He might have lost fingers. He might have lost toes. He might have lost part of his face. And, and, and this leprosy inspired universal fear. People thought it was highly contagious. We know now that it's not, but they thought it was incredibly contagious. And, and so this man approached Jesus. Now, this broke all of the taboos of society. I don't care which society you were in, but in Israeli society, this was a huge breach of societal rules. Lepers were the official outcasts of society. Okay, they, they were not supposed to be around people. And here Jesus was in a city and a leper came. He's breaking the rules. In, in the Old Testament law, if you want to read Leviticus 13 and 14, there's all these extensive rules about what lepers can do and what they can't do. And even if you think you might have leprosy, you've got to be excluded from the camp. You're an outcast. Uh, hence the idea of leper colonies because they people had to move away. They had to live away from the people. And they lived lives who were, that were intentionally excluded. I, I mean, they were feared. They were untouchables. Get this. No one would touch them. No one would touch them. I, I mean, first of all, they were afraid of the disease. If I touched them, I, I might get leprosy. And I don't want this horrible disease. I don't want to be cast out. I don't want to live like you're living. So people didn't want to touch them. But in Jewish law, not only did you risk getting the disease, but if you touched someone who had leprosy, you became ceremonially unclean. Unclean. Do you know what that meant? That meant, first of all, because you touched a leper, you now had to live in quarantine. We can relate to that now, can't we? Right? Does anybody besides me hate quarantine? I mean, we've been there. We've done that. We, you know, and, and for us, we did it in comfort. We did it, uh, you know, with uh, TVs and tablets and all kinds of, you know, restaurants that will bring food to your door and friends who will bring you stuff. I mean, it's not like we really suffered in quarantine. We just didn't like it. But for them, they had to move outside the camp. They, they left all their comforts. And it meant sacrifice. I mean, literally, when you finished uh, with your whole thing with leprosy, if you, you know, after the quarantine, the priest had to check you, and if you passed the test, you know what you got to do? You got to spend money offering sacrifices. So not only have you been quarantined where you haven't been able to work, and their government wasn't sending anybody checks when they weren't working, but then you had to take some of your animals and you had to offer them as a sacrifice. And if you didn't have animals, you had to buy animals and then you had to offer them as a sacrifice so that you could go back to life normal. So that you could return to your family, your friends, your job, all of that. So uh, this was a big it deal to the people watching this, people seeing this. A leper came in, they're all backing away. They're all freaked out. He's kneeling before Jesus, make me clean. And what does Jesus do? The last thing that anybody else watching this or encountering this man would do, Jesus reached out and he touched him. He touched him. He touched the untouchable. For, with all the reasons that you don't touch a leper, Jesus touched the leper. And, and what's, what's amazing is, did Jesus need to touch the leper to heal him? What do you think? Did Jesus need to touch him? No, he didn't need to touch him. I mean, if you read the accounts of Jesus, Jesus healed people by just going, okay, it's done. He could have just gone, you're clean. 
He did that later when the 10 lepers showed up to him. He just said, you guys are good. It's done. But he didn't do that. He could have done it. He could have didn't have to touch the man. But instead, he intentionally, right there with witnesses around him, reached out and touched the untouchable. I will. You're clean. Jesus broke the rules. He broke the rules. But, but see, here's the cool thing. When Jesus broke the rules, because Jesus is the one who made the rules, the rules are made to keep you from becoming unclean by them. Jesus touched the one who was unclean, and the man's uncleanness did not make Jesus unclean. Jesus' cleanness made the man clean. I mean, isn't that amazing? Isn't that absolutely cool? By the way, that's a picture of what happened on the cross. That's a picture of what happened on the cross for me and you. When Jesus, who was perfect and sinless, died as a sinless sacrifice, his righteousness was given to us and our unrighteousness was placed on Jesus. It was the great exchange. And he gives us a picture of that with a man who is unclean and Jesus, who is clean, touches him and makes him clean. Isn't that beautiful? That's what Jesus did. And then he told the man, follow the biblical rules so you can resume your life and go back to your family. In other words, Jesus healed the leper's body and he restored his life. That's the miracle. Jesus healed the leper's body and he restored his life. Jesus touched the untouchable and by doing that, he changed the man's life. Now, I read this story and immediately I realize some of us can identify with a leper. Right? Some of us can. We've been the outcasts. We've been the unwanted. We've been the ones who are shamed or excluded. Anyone? Anyone been there? See, some of you obviously haven't experienced enough life pain. You didn't raise your hands. See, I grew up moving all the time. I say all the time. I lived in 15 different houses the first 18 years of my life. I was always the new kid. I was always trying to be included. I was often excluded. And, uh, and I grew up that way. I grew up being the outcast. Add into that that I was incredibly socially awkward and excited about being with people, and it wasn't pretty. <laughs> and some of you are, 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 you know, you're like, yeah, I can relate to that. I've been the outcast. I've been the one who was shamed. I've been the one who was loathed, who was feared. You felt the judgment or the hatred directed toward you. Maybe you're living out a label that someone else gave you, or maybe you're living out a label that you took for yourself. But instead of leper, you're defining yourself as an addict, an adulterer, a murderer, a thief, a liar, a hypocrite, a cheat, a failure, or just a loser. See, whatever label you're living with, whatever failures or rebellions or mistakes in your life, would you please know that Jesus is not repulsed by your condition? Jesus is not repulsed by our condition. I mean, Jesus stepped into our world to free us from self-destruction. He took our failures upon himself so that we could be forgiven. He endured our pain so that we could be healed. And Jesus touches us as spiritual lepers. He is unafraid to embrace you and your mess or me and my mess. And some of you might attend church the first time wondering, as Pastor Joe mentioned last week, if I walk into church, will the roof collapse? Will lightning strike me? Because I'm in the house of God. I, I just want you to know, if you're wondering, if you're watching this and you're thinking, man, I can't go to church. My life is way too messed up. If this is the first time you've walked in the doors and you're thinking, I don't know what they're thinking about me. I don't even know how he's talking about me because I'm an outcast. Look, can I just tell you that God isn't angry with you? God is not angry at you. Okay, God is holy, he's pure, he's righteous, and, and scripture tells us that God hates sin, but here's why. God hates sin for the damage that it does to the people that he loves. God hates sin for the damage that it does to the people that he cares about. I mean, look, if you don't know the story of scripture, it's this, God created a perfect world for us. And uh, we rebelled against God. Okay, our rebellious choices ruined the world that God created. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans 5. He said, for just as through one man, sin entered the world and through sin, death. Therefore, death came to all because all sinned. 
All of us have sinned. We've joined in the rebellion and therefore death touches our lives. It touches our world in, in every way. And yet God desires to bless his children. That's what he wants to do. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless me. And yet every single time we choose our way instead of God's way, it results in pain and destruction and death for us. Let me say that again. Every time we rebel against God, every time we say, God, I know better than you. God, I'm gonna do it my way. I'm gonna live life my way on my terms. We are choosing pain and destruction and death for ourselves and for a lot of the people in our lives. And, and that's what God grieves. God grieves our self-inflicted wounds. God grieves our senseless rebellion. If you're a parent, you understand this. How many people are parents in this room? Okay, if you're watching online, you're a parent, raise your hand. See, parents, you get this. I mean, I would think that you would get this. Have you ever watched your children make destructive decisions that you were like shouting, don't do it, don't do this. You were encouraging not to do this. You were, you were praying for them not to do this and you watched them do this and, and you just, it broke your heart. And you're angry, yes, you're angry at the senselessness of the pain they're going through. The senselessness of the rebellion, the place it leads and the damage that it does. You don't hate them. You love them. And that's why it hurts. That's why it crushes us. Understand, that's what God is going through watching you be self-destructive. He hates the sin for the damage that it does to you because he loves you. And so God grieves our self-centered, hate-filled, violence-addicted world. By the way, that's why he gave his one and only son to pay for our sin. And that's why he promises a new creation that is untainted by sin. He's gonna create a new heaven and a new earth and, and, and we can be there because we're gonna get a new life and a new body that is uncorrupted, that doesn't, isn't filled with these urges of rebellion. Anybody excited about that? <laughs> Some of you are like, yeah, my body hurts. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Just wait, God isn't done with you. He's not done with you, but he's not angry with you. He just grieves the damage that is done to you. But here's the good news. Jesus will restore your life if you ask. Jesus will restore your life if you ask. That's what the leper did. He came to Jesus, broke all the rules, came to Jesus, fell down at his feet. Lord, if you will, make me clean. That's what it takes. It takes you approaching Jesus and saying, please help me, and he will. Jesus restored, think about it. Jesus gave him his whole life back. He restored his body. He restored his job. He restored his relationships with his family. And he restored his worship. All of it. The totality of his life was restored. So understand that God will restore your life. That's what he wants to do. He wants to restore your life. He wants to put your pieces back together in a beautiful way, in a redemptive way, in a way that, that, that heals you and gives you life. Now, understand that even though God will restore your life, God will not rescue you from your problems and your failures. You're deep in debt. God's not gonna suddenly have you win the lottery. Okay? You, you, you made a mistake. Okay, you're gonna have to suffer the consequences of that mistake. He's not gonna rescue you from that. From that. He will redeem your situations, but he won't rescue you. And, and understand, if you, if you ask God to restore your life, he is going to change you more than anybody else in your story. See, what God's not gonna do, he's not gonna change your circumstances. He's not gonna change your spouse. <laughs> he's not gonna change your kids. He's not gonna change your job that you hate. He's gonna change you. It's gonna make you more like Jesus. He's gonna teach you how to rejoice in the midst of difficult circumstances. He's gonna teach you how to, to love people in a whole new way. He's gonna teach you the glory of forgiveness. It's gonna change your life, not your legal mess. See, that's what he wants to do. Think about it. A lot of times we ask God to heal our bodies and Jesus wants to restore our lives. A lot of times we ask God to fix our problems and God wants to redeem our hearts, alter our attitude and bring clarity to our vision. 
we're asking for a lot less than God wants to do because we're asking for the simple things that are right in front of us. We're asking for the temporal things. God wants to do eternal things in our lives. If you ask Jesus, he will restore your life. But he's gonna change you to do that. See, here's the reality. Jesus wants to lead your life, not fix your problems. Jesus wants to lead your life, not fix your problems. There's a, there's a lot of us that want a problem-solving Jesus. We want Jesus to kind of come in and fix our stuff and then leave us alone. That's not what Jesus is willing to do. Jesus wants to be Lord of your life. That's why if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. Okay, it means that you have to surrender your life and say, Jesus, I'm gonna follow you. You're the master, you're the king, I'm gonna do what you say, not what I want. But a lot of us are trying to, you know, we're trying to manipulate the, the relationship with God. You're gonna lose if you do that, by the way. But Jesus wants to lead your life. That's why his invitation to the disciples was what? Follow me, follow me. Well, where are we gonna go? Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me and I will give you purpose in life. But you have to follow me, which means I want to lead your life. We cry out to God because we want to escape the pain of the moment. Do you know that God wants to develop your character through the pain? Let me say it again. We cry out to God because we want to escape the pain of this moment. This is terrible, God. This is awful, God. Fix it. God says, no, I don't want to fix it. I want to grow you. I want to fix you. Not the problem. The apostle Paul put it this way. Romans chapter five, verse three. He said, we rejoice in our sufferings. That doesn't sound fun. We rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces endurance. That doesn't sound fun either, does it? Endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint. We like that part. I want to get, can I get to the hope without the other stuff? No. No, you can't. That's why Jesus wants to lead your life, not fix your problems. Because if he just fixed your problems, you would continue being exactly like you are right now. And he wants, he wants to grow you in the image of Jesus, his image. You see, God desires to teach us how to rejoice in him when life isn't exactly what we want it to be. In other words, Jesus didn't come to save the day. He came to save our lives for all eternity. So Jesus healed the leper's body and he restored his life. And he can do that in your life if you ask him. And I, and I just gotta pause right now. And if you've never asked Jesus to restore your life, you've never surrendered to Jesus, you've never confessed Jesus as Lord, would you do that today? Just do it today. Where you're sitting in the room, just say, okay, Jesus, I give up. I, I need you. Please save me. He'll do it. If you're watching uh, online, you look, just, just say, Jesus, change my life. I can't do this without you, and I want you to take control. I want to follow you. And if you do that, let us know. And if you're in the room, our prayer team will be here at the end of the service. They would love to pray with you and rejoice with you. If you're in the room, fill out a Connect card. Drop it in the offering box. Say, I trusted Jesus, I need to talk to someone. Come find a pastor after the service, let us talk with you. If you're joining us online and, and you made that decision, then let us know, email us, tell us, tell the service host right now, hey, I want to do this, I wanna follow Jesus, I want him to lead my life, not just fix my problems. Now, followers of Jesus, let's talk to you for a minute. Followers of Jesus, are people of uncomfortable grace. So if you're an outcast and you discover today that Jesus can change your life, that's awesome. He can restore your life, he can heal your life, he can do all that, that's great. But if you're already somebody who has experienced the grace of God, then understand that we are people of uncomfortable grace. And uncomfortable grace is one of our core values here at Calvary. We believe that followers of Jesus should give the same limitless grace that they have received from God. We give that to other people. We are people of uncomfortable grace. Uh, so if you have already decided to follow Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that he rose from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, 
then God has sent you to touch the untouchables. God has sent you to welcome the outcasts. I mean, Jesus set the example in this story and numerous times throughout the Gospels. The Apostle Paul gave the direction to the church at at Ephesus, chapter 4. He said, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Be kind to one another, be compassionate to one another, be graceful to one another. So that means if we're going to represent Jesus as individuals and as a church, we need to care for people. We care. You see, love cares for the hurting and the broken. Love isn't too busy to help. Love demonstrates compassion. Love is patient. Love is, what's the other word? Kind, yeah. Love is patient, love is kind. We care. If we're gonna be people of uncomfortable grace, we care. We, we care about people. Now, love cares for the outcast because the outcast is what Jesus called the least of these. If you're not familiar with uh, the parables that Jesus told in Matthew 25, can I encourage you to go home and read them? Uh, the last parable, there's three parables in Matthew 25 that Jesus tells. And the last one is called the parable of the sheep and the goats. And in that parable, Jesus uh, rewards those people who, who care for the least of these. And he condemns those people who don't care for the least of these. In fact, Jesus said, you know, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison. You didn't come to me. And and these will, the, the unrighteous will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you? When did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or a stranger or sick and in prison and not care for you? And Jesus said, I'll tell you this, as you did not do it to the least of these brothers of mine, you did not do it to me. You see, they didn't see them. If we're gonna care, we must see people in need. We have to see them. And apathy and self-centeredness blinds us to the outcasts around us. Do you know, you know what we see? We see our hurts really clearly, don't we? We see our struggles, we see our obstacles, we see our problems, we see our needs. They are crystal clear. We talk about them all the time, don't we? We're always complaining. We're always saying, well, but I need this. I've gotta face this and I've gotta go through that. We see our stuff. If if we're kind of nice people, we'll see like our, our friends stuff too, right? Maybe the people in your life group and you're like, oh, I see their needs too. But we don't look much past that. Apathy and self-centeredness blinds us to the outcasts. Have you ever asked God to open your eyes so that you could see the least of these around you? I just dare you to do that. If you wanna be a person of uncomfortable grace, if you wanna follow the lead of Jesus, then ask God to open your eyes because first we have to see people and then we have to be involved in their lives. Right? I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me. We got to be involved in their lives. Jesus reached out and touched the leper. That's compassion on the outcast. See, sometimes we see the outcasts and if we're being honest, we see them and we're disgusted. We see them and we pass judgment. Well, you know, if they hadn't ruined their life this way, if they hadn't made that, you know, and we pass judgment on them. There's no compassion. And historically, that's what the church has been guilty of. You know, you talk to people who don't come to church, uh, any church at all, and they're gonna tell you, ah, the church is full of hypocrites and people who judge others. Right? Ah, the church is full of judgment. And historically, they're absolutely true. The church has been much better at casting people out than we have been at embracing outcasts. Let me say that again. The church has been historically much better at casting people out than we have been at embracing outcasts. And that's not Jesus. 
See, we tend to avoid the lepers instead of getting too close to them. We uh, build leper colonies so we don't have to see them or touch them. It's time for us to repent. It's time for us, the people of God, to be like Jesus, to be people of uncomfortable grace. And see, uncomfortable grace begins when we care about people, but it really takes heart and it means something when we serve. We care and we serve. By the way, radical service is another one of our core values here at Calvary. We believe that followers of Jesus best demonstrate the love of Jesus to people through serving and acts of kindness. Acts of kindness and service. You know, I, when I've tried to tell people about Jesus on the street, some people have gotten mad at me, but no one has ever gotten angry at me for trying to serve them. <laughs> did, did you know that? I don't know, you might find the same thing. I mean, we got to, you know, do teacher appreciation at the high school this week, and, and we took a whole bunch of food over there, and we gave it to them, and there was not one person complaining <laughs> about the food that we took. In fact, they filled out, you know, thank you cards. Okay, I, I mean... I, we really believe that the best way to demonstrate the love of Jesus to others is through acts of kindness and service. You see, good intentions without actions are worthless. You guys ever hear the road to hell is paved with good intentions? Hey, can you lose weight by thinking I need to lose weight? No. Then they're polishing off that half gallon of ice cream right out of the, I need to lose some weight. Not gonna work, is it? I need to lose some weight. Can I have seconds? Good intentions. Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't work. Oh, I need to get in shape. You tell yourself that while you're sitting on the couch watching the infomercial about exercise equipment. I, I, I need to get in shape. I need to do something. That's good intentions. Doesn't result in anything, does it? You have to actually do something to make a difference. So we can declare ourselves people of grace and compassion we can tell people we care all we want to, but without action, you know what we are? Hypocrites and liars. Do you think maybe that's why the church in America has lost its voice? Maybe that's why we've lost our power. So we need to act as individuals and as a church. We need to care and we need to serve. Uh, so as a church, we can, we can kind of do this. As your pastor, I can say, hey, we're gonna do some stuff and we got great people leading teams. And so uh, I, I just let me tell you what you guys have done, okay? As a church, what you have done is last year, you gave $118,000 to families in need. Yeah, you guys did that. I mean, you gave them meals, you gave them food, you gave them gas, you gave them, uh, you know, helped with rent, you helped with fixing their cars, helped with utilities, all different kinds of things, medical bills, all kinds of things. Uh, you donated about 1,000 gift backpacks for, for Christmas for children from the border up through the Wallapai Nation. You uh, helped 100 families of 100 plus children whose parents are in prison through Angel Tree Ministries. In two weeks, uh, Pastor Robert already mentioned, we're doing Evening of Hope, which is a prom for special needs uh, adults. I mean, this is, this is a great way of caring for the least of these. So as a church, we are attempting to care for the forgotten, the struggling, the marginalized, the outcasts. That's what we're doing as Calvary. But can I just tell you that the real power to impact the outcasts of our world is with you? I mean, it's, it's not the formal big events that Calvary does. It's not the stuff that we do as a group. That's really great, okay? It, it changes people's mind about coming and visiting. It changes people's mind about us all being hypocrites and judgmental. But the real power is with you as a servant of Jesus Christ, as a follower of Jesus Christ. When you ask God to open your eyes to see the outcast, when you decide you're gonna put your hands to work serving people, it changes things. When you start including the outcasts, when you start inviting the lonely, not just to come to church with you, but to, to join you for a meal afterwards, to you know, join your life group, to share their life. It, it changes people when you bless the struggling and you weep with the broken. And it is up to us to be the people of healing and hope to every single person that we meet throughout the week. 
And if we will take on that responsibility, if we will take on that mission to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to see the people and to care for the people and to help the people, then we're really being people of uncomfortable grace and radical service. And we'll see Jesus change our communities in a powerful way. So whether you feel like an outcast today or you know the joy of being included in Christ, I pray that you discover and delight in Jesus because he will restore your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that in our rebellion and in our defiance, you didn't just leave us be, but you invaded our world in the form of Jesus and you suffered for us and you loved the people around you even when they didn't love you back and you touch the untouchable and you love the unlovely and you heal the sick and you fed the hungry and you suffered for my selfishness. You suffered for my rebellion. You suffered, suffered for my defiance so that I could be a son and daughter of God so that I could be your child, so that I could have hope, so that I could have forgiveness. And God, you offer that to anybody who calls on your name. So God, I pray that we would call on your name as the outcasts who need embracing. And I pray, Lord, that we would leave this place looking to embrace the outcasts in our community, to convey the love and the hope of Jesus that has changed our lives so that your mission will be accomplished in this world. God, may we never be the ones who cast people out. May we be those that welcome the outcasts in. In Jesus' name, amen.